Good evening. My name is Joe Kim, and on behalf of the organizing committee, I'd like to welcome you to the Education and Cognition Public Lecture, which closes out a busy day one at the 10th Annual McMaster Conference on Education and Cognition. I'd like to thank all of our campus partners, including the McPherson Institute for Innovation and Excellence in Teaching and Learning, the Faculty of Science, Department of Psychology, Neuroscience and Behavior, and the Alumni Association and the Office of the President for their ongoing support to help make these events possible. Now, over the course of the pandemic, I think we've all had a crash course in teaching online and experienced successes, failures, and perhaps new insights. As we look forward to the fall 2022 term with cautious optimism, our conference theme this year explores looking forward to the next decade of evidence-based interventions in education. So I think it's fitting that our speaker for tonight for this public lecture is Tony Bates, who will share his insights for teaching online, in person, or both, some guidelines for deciding. Tony Bates is the president and CEO of the Tony Bates Association, a private company specializing in consultancy and training in the planning and management of e-learning and distance education. He's also a distinguished visiting professor at the G. Raymond Chang School of Continuing Education uh, at Toronto Metropolitan University and a research associate at Contact North Ontario. He's the author of 12 books, including his latest, a free open online textbook for faculty instructors called Teaching in a Digital Age, which has been downloaded over 200,000 times since its publication in April 2015. It's also been or is being translated into 10 languages. So safe to say, uh, Tony is a very sought after speaker, uh, especially in these troubling pandemic times and all the issues that we're going through. So uh, I'm very grateful for uh, having him join us today. Immediately following uh, uh, Tony's remarks, there will be a Q&A session and you can participate by sending in your questions on the Q&A chat and we'll try to get to as many as possible. And now I give you Tony Bates. Hello everybody. Um, it's been an interesting couple of years, well, I mean, interesting and exhausting couple of years. So uh, we've seen some major shifts in what's been happening in universities and colleges uh, across the world as a result of COVID-19. But on the other hand, what it's done is to really reinforce some of the things that were happening before COVID-19. And I wanna talk about particularly some of the things that happened before COVID-19. Uh, the switch to synchronous Zoom online learning in March 2020 was the only practical solution for most instructors. There was no time to redesign teaching. However, in 2022, uh, continuing in that mode is no longer accessible, acceptable. Uh, two reasons, perhaps the most important from an instructor perspective, is that it was high, highly stressful. Um, it, it's very difficult incorporating uh, Zoom lectures uh, into your teaching, but more importantly, perhaps learning was less effective than either in-person or properly designed online learning. We have a lot of research now over the last two years that showed that uh, students as well as instructors struggled with this mode of teaching. It's not that it can't be done, uh, it can be done and it can be done well but it needs a fairly big shift in the approach to teaching and learning for it to work. What we've had before COVID-19, we had over 30 years of prior experience and research and best practices in teaching online. And partly because it was an emergency, most of this was ignored. Uh, it wasn't applied to teaching in the pandemic. So what we need to do is to apply both the lessons from online learning pre-pandemic based on a good deal of research and lessons learned during the pandemic because we did learn some new things about online learning and we need to incorporate that in, in the way that we use uh, digital and online teaching. So what I wanna do in this session is to 
help understand the affordances of both in-person and online teaching. By affordances, I mean what each does best. And, and similarly, the affordances of synchronous and asynchronous learning. And to do that, I think we need to talk about what is an appropriate learning environment when you go online. And in particular, I want to apply the psychology of effective online learning, because a lot of the good design in online learning is based on sound psychological theory and practice. Now, in particular, every instructor now needs to think about what kind of course they need to teach. Uh, at one time, pre, certainly pre-COVID, we had two, uh, two worlds that were pretty separate. There was face-to-face -face teaching and there was fully online. But now we've got a whole mix um, of what's called blended learning, face-to-face uh, -face incorporating classroom aids maybe, which has been around for a long time. But we also now have flipped classrooms where the um, a lecture is recorded and students come in to discuss the lecture or vice versa. And more importantly, I think hybrid learning where online learning is integrated in a deliberately designed way with face-to-face -face teaching. And then we have what's called high flex learning, uh, which is really an option for students to take it, take the studies in whatever form they want. I want to point out that there are many forms of blended learning. As I said, there's technology enhanced learning. There's in-class lectures with students then going off to do some work on a learning management system. Uh, there's flipped classes. There's the Royal Roads model of having one semester on campus and two online. Uh, there's hybrid, uh, it reduced in-class teaching time to allow students to spend more time online, but still with in-class teaching focused on what in-class teaching does best, and then it's high flex. And so all these alternatives, uh, you really need some kind of decision-making framework for deciding what's most appropriate rather than, than just doing what's most convenient as an instructor. Um, I'm going to use the term affordances. It's a psychological term. It goes back to a guy called James Gibson in 1977. Uh, it was applied mainly to tools such as door handles. Um, the design of a door handle uh, encourage you to maybe push it down or put your hand flat against the door and push and so on. This is kind of the, you know, what is it intuitively good for? Um, and what I'm going to be talking about here is educational affordances. What, what does one medium do somewhat better than another in an educational context? And I have to say that in terms of education, there's no real research into the affordances of online learning. It's only recently when faculty have had to make more choices about tech, media and technology that the term has come into greater use. So it's mainly based on experience of what a teacher finds or an instructor finds works and what it doesn't. And again, an affordance isn't general, it's specific to the context in which it's used. So for instance, uh, use of media in science might, the affordances will be different than the use of media in, in, in humanities for it and so on. Um, and there are affordances of in-person teaching. What are the things that in-person teaching does better than say online teaching. And again, there are some intuitive things like teaching hands-on skills or lab work needs to be done in person rather than online. Although as we shall see that more and more online learning challenges some of these assumptions. For instance, we're finding that use of virtual reality or simulations and games is often just as good for teaching certain scientific concepts as going into a lab. And then this text, um, text we, we find uh, is very good for evidence-based arguments, for analysis, for uh, presenting different viewpoints and different approaches and so on. Um, so where analysis is needed, text can be very useful. Video is very good for demonstrating processes. Uh, for instance, uh, you, you can do an animation of how a particular bacteria works, for instance. 
And as I said, it's likely to vary by subject area. So at the moment, it's really intuitive for most instructors. But over a period of time, this experience gets shared and builds up. And then we begin to feel a bit more confident about talking about some of the affordances. So if we look at the affordances of synchronous learning, synchronous is the same time and same place. So for instance, if you've got students working synchronously with the instructor, you can get an immediate response from the students to questions they have to think on their feet, for instance. Asynchronous is any time and any place. And one of the advantages of asynchronous learning is students can stop, start and review. So if you've got a, an asynchronous recording of a lecture, for instance, they can stop, start and review it as many times as, as they want. And if they're doing an on, in an online discussion, which is asynchronous, they can uh, give a considered response to a question. They can go off and do some research, for instance, and come back. And so you can see what I'm meaning here about the, the, the affordances here. What, what do, 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 do these me, uh, methods, modes of delivery do best? So synchronous will be classroom teaching, video conferencing live, live video conferencing, Virtual reality is synchronous, it's a, it's a in real time activity. Asynchronous would be the use of learning management systems, uh, any text, text materials, uh, textbooks or uh, online uh, text, and recorded video and recorded audio or podcasts. Uh, these are all asynchronous technologies. So the research on emergency remote learning th threw up a lot of problems or a lot of limitations of synchronous online learning. One thing that came up, again, a psychological aspect of it, that there was too much passive screen time for students. This was particularly true in the school sector where students often had wall-to-wall uh, -wall video conferencing lectures from their teachers from maybe six hours continuously in some cases, one lecture after another from the teacher. And there was too little student interaction. We know that students need to be active when learning for it to be effective. And it resulted in work overload, both for instructors and students. And for synchronous online working, uh, so synchronous online teaching to work, considerable adaptation is needed. Um, there's quite a lot of research to show that shorter presentations of 10 to 15 minutes are more effective uh, with, stop, with a stop for a, a discussion and interaction with the students uh, online and use of breakout rooms as well for interaction. And also students need access to the recording so they can go back over the material again. So in, in, in a way, you, you're building in some asynchronous activities to the synchronous teaching. And this is, raises the question then of what makes in-person teaching special, so especially if you can do a lecture online, why would the students come in person? Now, the default position for most instructors is that in-person is inherently superior. It's been a way we've always done things, so it must be better. However, there's a lot of research to say that it isn't, that isn't the case. Uh, online learning can deliver just e effectively as in-person teaching. What matters is the condition. And this is fairly obvious if you think about it. You can do face-to-face -face teaching badly, or you can do it well. Similarly with online learning, you can do it badly, or you can do it well. The conditions are much more important than the mode of delivery. If that's the case then, uh, I suggest a law of equal substitution. Everything can be taught as well online as in person, except, in other words, we should be looking at what is it that online, uh, that face-to-face -face teaching does that online learning cannot do, and we need to test that. So why get on the bus to McMaster? What are you doing on campus that couldn't be done just as well online? And if you ask most students if they have the choice of doing it at home or coming on campus to do it, many will choose to do it at home. Not all, because some like the, the, the personal aspect of in-person teaching. But it's a good question for every instructor. What, why, what am I doing that's special 
in in person that they couldn't get if I did this online or if I did it differently online. The answer to this depends on three factors. Uh, student differences, the type of student that you're teaching, um, subject requirements, and non-teaching issues. Most of the affordance discussion has been focused on the middle one, subject requirements, but also there are other factors that are important in making this decision. If we look at students, again, this is a generalization, students differ, but on average, older, more experienced students with family want fully online. It's more flexible for them. They can fit it around the other demands of their life. Uh, for these students, learning is important, but they have other priorities as well. Students with part-time work or family responsibilities uh, want hybrid. They, they want some of the face-to-face -face interaction, but they also want the flexibility to do a lot of the work online. And again, most young students fresh from school and particularly students without adequate internet access or equipment at home, and there are quite a few of those students around, they want the in-person experience. And the problem for most instructors is they're probably gonna have a mix of these students in any one class. But certainly if your programs are say professional, uh, uh, aimed at uh, professional updating and professional qualifications, your students are more likely to be adult learners and they have a marked preference for online learning. The second is subject requirements. And as I said, it varies from subject to subject, but theory, content, and soft skills can usually be taught just as well, if not better online than in class. Whereas hands-on and practical work are best done in person. But again, there's no theory or evidence-based justification for this, there's just experience. And as I said, we're finding as we experiment more and more with online learning, particularly in situations where there's no option, that often some of the things we take for granted as being best in person can actually be done online with the important qualification if you have the time and money to do it. So this raises the question of what are the affordances of in-person teaching? And some of the things that I feel are important to be done online, uh, in person, are hands-on skills, social learning, building trust amongst students and between students and the instructor, getting a better knowledge of students by the instructor that can help, which, which is worth doing if you're willing to adapt your teaching to the differences you've got in your students, and the option of real-time interaction and spontaneity. But again, as I said, all of these are also possible online, just probably easy to do in person. And then there's a whole host of non-teaching factors, but they're equally important for supporting learning. The social life, uh, for many young people, it's the social life at university that is just as important as the academic life. The opportunity mixed with other people at the same age um, bonding and building trust and a sense of belonging to the institution. It's very important for uh, motivating students. Support facilities that are on campus, such as study areas, the library and so on. And informal counseling and chance meetings, bumping into your professor in the corridor and so on. So, and th th there's other non-teaching factors that are important. And again, the importance of these will vary on the kind of student. Um, adult learners are often not really interested so much in most of this. They've been through that, been there, done that. I want to get on with the rest of my life. But for 18 year olds, this is probably very important. So how do you choose what to do online and what to do face to face? Um, well, here's one strategy. This is the, the strategy I use. I identify my overall teaching approach and the necessary learner activities. This is very important. What are students expected to do? What could they be doing in my course that would improve their learning or help their learning? What resources are available to me and to the students? And then analyze the most appropriate mode for each learner activity. I've taken an example here from science. This is uh, looking at uh, glucose uh, and its role in 
um, treatment of blood diseases and so on. So you can learn the theory and terminology around uh, blood and the biology of blood. You, that, most of the learning theory and terminology can be done better online than face to face. It's not a good use of your time trying to get the students to learn the theory in class. They can do that online. But they have to observe analytes under the microscope. So that's best done face to face. You could actually do a design of an experiment um, using virtual equipment. You could give the students the equipment and ask them to put it together in order to do a particular equipment. It would be virtual equipment, uh, but they could do that online. And that's often been done in some scientific teaching these days. You can look at the video of interactions under the microscope. That could be done online. You can have um, you can record the interactions and make it available as a video, which the students then download. And the advantage of that is they can watch it many times until they get a clear understanding of what's happening. But inserting glucose into the blood sample, that probably has to be done face to face because it's a physical activity and it has to have a certain amount of dexterity and skill in doing that. So again, what you're doing is taking the teaching of a topic and breaking it down into the various activities that you want students to do, then working out what's best done online and face to face. If we're talking about a fully online environment, as I said, fully online learners are often older and more mature. Studying is only part of their priorities. They require the flexibility of online learning where they can fit it in when they can. So even synchronous lecturing is not really uh, suitable for many mature and online students because they have to be at a set time and uh, have a computer or their phones with them. Um, and they would prefer the flexibility of being able to access it whenever they want. The other important thing about online learners is they're studying on their own in isolation. And I'm gonna come back to that because you need to create online a learning environment that tries to break down that isolation and, and takes account of the fact that they're working on their own and not in a group in front of a teacher. And it's clear that most online learners need support and guidance to manage their learning. It's not something that comes automatically to many students. They need the appropriate technology and in, most important of all, they need the teaching designed for an online context. Um, and that means rethinking how you deliver your courses um, when you're moving online. Um, this means looking at the affordances of asynchronous online learning. Um, I still believe despite the advances in synchronous uh, technologies that the learning management system is the core tool for online blended learning because it provides that flexibility of any time, anywhere. Students can uh, stop, start, replay, they can go into it, they can work, save, this, save their work, come back to it another time. You can use, you can embed multimedia teaching, text, video, and audio into the learning management system. You can have links to synchronous lectures within the learning management system. And very importantly, a learning management system enables you to manage the workload of both the students and yourself. One of the things you have to think about when going online is all the work that students do, not just uh, the lectures that you might be doing synchronously. Um, I like to think of about uh, a limit of about eight hours per week for most students per subject uh, for a three credit course. And in that eight hours, you have to accommodate everything, the delivery of content, uh, the activities that students do, any assignment work and so on, all should be embedded within that roughly eight hours per week per student for a three credit course. And the learning management system allows you to organize your work in that week. It provides a kind of structure that a classroom does for face-to-face -face teaching. And you need structured interaction via online discussion form, forums. Uh, that's another affordance of uh, the online system. Um, and that can be very useful in two ways, it's breaking down the isolation of students and also enabling them to go off and do research and come back and bring that research into the online discussions. 
And I want to look at the psychology here. Um, and I want to ask some fundamental questions. What is knowledge? How do you know something is true? How do you get to know something? And what do you need in order to learn? And the answer to those questions should drive the way you design your online courses. I want to give two analogies here about two different approaches to online learning. Uh, one is thinking of knowledge as coal. It's there to be mined. You've got all that research, you've got all the theory, uh, you dig it out, you organize it as a lecturer, and you deliver it into the heads of students. And their job is to understand and comprehend. And there's another view of knowledge as development, developmental, it, uh, a constructivist approach to knowledge. Um, let's think of the concept of heat. When you're a child, you can touch something and you know it's hot. And then you go to school and you learn that you can measure heat. You can put numbers on it, Fahrenheit or centigrade. Then you go to university and you learn about the chemistry of heat. And all the time, our concept or understanding of heat is developing as more and more experience builds on past experience. And if that's the case, learning is developmental, then my analogy for that will be teaching as gardening. Students will learn naturally. What you have to provide is the right environment for them to learn. Um, so that's a different approach to learning. Um, and I think it's very important when you come to look at what should be done online, what should be done face to face, etc. Now, there are many possible learning environments. What we have mainly is a 19th century learning environment in schools and, and university campuses. Everybody comes to school at the same time. You have uh, lectures organized in discrete blocks, etc. Uh, people all have to be there at the same time, and then they all go home at the same time. It doesn't have to be like that in online learning. An online course can have a completely different learning environment, although many of the elements in both campus or online need to be there within that environment. Another environment, of course, is experience, work, family, and life. That's a, a very efficient learning environment. Um, and then you can have a blended environment, campus plus online. But they all need certain common elements that support learning. And in my book, I've given an example of uh, a complete learning environment, such as understanding the learner characteristics, the content of the course, the topics you want to teach, the skills that students have to develop, uh, what kind of support you give them, uh, uh, give to the learners, what resources you have, how you're going to assess the students. All these need to be built into the learning environment, whether it's online or face to face, but you can do it differently online to the way that we do it face to face. And in fact, there are all kinds of learning environments. There's military training is one, uh, nature as a learning environment, there's an online course, as well as the traditional on campus course, and there are probably many others. And what we find is that there's different, uh, when it comes back to the question of how do we learn and what do we consider to be knowledge, we can have a behavioristic approach, which you'll find in a lot of computer assisted learning, uh, based on comprehension and testing. Uh, even in even now in artificial intelligence, that's the main applications in education is that adaptive learning, uh, giving a student a test, give them feedback, and if they get it wrong, redirect them again. And computer scientists in particular tend to approach learning in a very behaviorist way, not surprisingly, because basically they assume that humans think in the same way that pro computer programming works. And I think that's a rather misleading uh, analogy to make. I don't think humans do think in that way. Um, but nevertheless, behaviorism has been very, very influential in teaching, particularly in North America. Uh, Lynch made a very interesting comment. If artificial intelligence is gonna benefit education, it will require strengthening the connection between AI developers and experts in learning sciences. Otherwise, AI will simply discover new ways to teach poorly and perpetuate erroneous ideas about teaching and learning. I'm afraid that's where we are with most 
applications of artificial intelligence these days to teaching and learning. So if we take the idea that learning is developmental and cognitively constructed, such as heat, then how do we teach 21st century skills like critical thinking and knowledge management and problem solving? And in particular, how do we progress thinking skills? How do we take somebody's critical thinking ability when they come into your class and make sure you improve that when they leave and hand them on to somebody else? And Dalhousie University has done an interest, has an interesting project called Daedalus. They get all the instructors together and work out what their learning outcomes are for their course, what learning outcomes need to come first and what need to come second. And then they built a decision tree. What, what this resulted in, interestingly, is that they used to teach theory in the third year. And when they got all the professors together, they realized that the theory should be taught in the first year. Uh, they were having a lot of, the reason they went through this, a lot of students weren't completing their Bachelor of Computer Science. After they went through this exercise and they worked out the transition, how you hand on from one course to another, that the completion rates went up, theory got uh, taught in the third year, in the first year, because it was a foundation for all the other stuff. So curriculum planning here is really important. How do we develop these 21st century skills over a course? Uh, I will say one other thing, the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario, three or four years ago, tested students coming into university, undergraduate students, and tested them going out, and found that while their numeracy and literacy skills improved, their critical thinking skills didn't, which is a bit of a concern when you think they had four years of undergraduate education. And there are a lot of criticisms of the study. Can you teach critical thinkings outside of a particular subject area? Is it very subject specific, which I think it is. And were the tests within that subject area sufficiently good? But it is a good question. How do we know that we are teaching these skills and that students are improving at them as they go through university? Now, we know a lot about teaching skills. Uh, I make the distinction between facts, ideas, and principles, knowing something, and skills such as understanding, analyzing, evaluating, applying, and doing. Both are necessary in today's society. But if we look traditionally at what we teach in universities, content has often been the traditional priority. I make an exception a bit in science because they talk about they had to spend a lot of time in labs and so on. But often in the non-scientific, non-STEM subjects, content has been the priority. And now there's more demand for these 21st century skills, which are really important, not just for work, but for managing in life. Um, so we know a lot about teaching skills. They're relatively context specific. Problem solving in medicine is not the same way, uh, same thing as problem solving in business. There's some overlap, but the context is different and the content is different. You have to know different things in medicine to solve problems than you do in, in, in business. Also, the approach to problem solving is different. In medicine, you're risk adverse. In business, if you don't take some risk, then you're not going to be very successful. So um, it is relatively context specific. Um, being a thoughtful analytic scientist doesn't necessarily make you a thoughtful analytic husband, for instance. We also know that learners need lots of practice in online learning, uh, in uh, developing a skill. Uh, you need small steps initially, so students build confidence. It, most important, you need regular feedback from an expert. And a skill is developed over a lifetime rather than one course. I make a distinction here between a competency, which probably could be taught in one course, and a skill like critical thinking that's ongoing, and hopefully you get better even after you've left university if you've been taught well, so you can carry on learning um, and developing that skill into later life. So as I said, in the implications for curriculum design, what we add, do we add to lifelong learning from year one to year four? I'm going to give, I think I've got just about enough time to give three examples of using online learning for skills development. 
Simon Fraser University Biological Sciences, uh, third year course, the instructor found that many students came to third year undergraduate science expecting a right answer for every scientific question. And they were particularly poor at scientific argumentation, using science to support or to attack a particular set of assumptions and so on. And so the instructor built a simple web-based tool to improve their scientific argumentation. She took the topic of wolves should be killed to protect endangered woodland caribou in Northern British Columbia and Alberta. It's still a very uh, contentious issue. Just last week, there was a big spread in one of our local papers about this. Um, what she did, she provided a web page with pro reasons in green on the green side and con reasons on the other, and two boxes, uh, one for the reason, and the second one is the evidence to support the reason. And students had to give both pro and con answers. And in, and you can see they could type in uh, arguments to support the arguments as well as the reasons. And at the end, they had to come to a decision of some kind about whether this is a good policy or not. And she found that there's, uh, in, in a pre and post test, their argumentative reasoning skills increased significantly when the students were able to use this tool. A second one is from the University of British Columbia uh, from forestry, uh, soil identification. Students are often sent out into the forest to take samples and analyze those samples, bring them back uh, and then get assessed on their analysis. And this is very labor intensive for the instructor. She had to grow out with a group of four or five students that was the only manageable size. And what she did is go to a local app developer that was, has developed a Quest app for use on phones. You, you have to go to a, you use a map to go and find things. Usually it was cookies or something like that. And she redesigned it for the, for the um, soil analysis. And the third one is from Veterinary Science, University of Prince Edward Island. Uh, part of the teaching requires a model of a dog's heart. And these plastinated models are very expensive. You can only afford one for a, one per class at the most. You can take them apart and put them together so you can show all the parts of the heart and how they work together. So because she had all these students clustering around, 30 of them, it wasn't a very good way to teach it. So what she did was to make a simple uh, video at home where she took apart the, the, uh, the heart and put it together, explained the parts and so on, made a video of that. And then when the students come in, uh, the, the, the heart, the plastinated heart has a QR code, and that's the URL to the video on the university server. So all the student has to do is take a photograph of the QR code, go home, and they can play the video at any time they want to. Now, I could give other examples of constructivist approach to on online learning, such as online discussion forums, e-portfolios, uh, continuous assessment, online learning, a lot of discussion about the use of proctoring technology. There's no need to use proctoring technology. Uh, in learning, with a learning management system, you can track the students' work as they go, so you can continuously assess. And again, if you're trying to develop a skill, you can see what their skill is when they come in, and you can see how that skill is building up through the course from the traces they leave in the learning management system as they're working. Um, and there's Garrison et al.'s community of inquiry with three core elements that 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 they argue are needed, and I, I agree, to in successful online courses. Social presence, the uh, awareness of uh, the other students, uh, teacher presence, absolutely critical, and cognitive presence, engagement with the materials. And all three of those are important and support each other. Um, 
And in the end, I would say that mode of delivery is agnostic regarding teaching methods. You can all use all these teaching methods either in class or online, but you have to redesign the teaching if you're going to do it online. So the core requirements for all teaching are know your students' learning environment, clear learning objectives, of course, content, knowing, and skills, understanding the affordances of media, such as synchronous and asynchronous, um, what the media characteristics are, what, what they do best, and then the appropriate choice of delivery mode and choice of media um, to match that. And it might be a combination of in-person and online teaching, or you might be able to do it entirely online or in person. So what in your subject area cannot be taught online and why not? Could you think of a way you could teach online if you had the time and resources? What would be the benefits? And any other advantages or disadvantage of in-person teaching or the best way to blend them? So over to you. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, we got a number of questions in. Um, maybe I could just kind of set things up this way. So during the pandemic, um, schools were forced online, you know, wor workplaces, if they could, were forced to have uh, people work remotely. So it was sort of like this forced experiment. And, you know, as we're cautiously emerging, one of the things I think that has been demonstrated, like some of these things are possible, things that we just never thought, like having meetings online, you know, maybe we're kind of tired of Zoom meetings and stuff, but, um, I, and even our conference this year, this EDCOG conference, we're fully hybrid this year, where all the activities are fully available online or in person, and our public lecturer, uh, Tony Bates, you're giving your talk uh, fully online. So my first question to you is that, do you think these are just kind of reactionary moves that will eventually go away and things will just be back the way that they used to be? Or do you think there's sort of a permanent shift in how we're going to run things in society now that we got a taste of this? I think what happened, COVID was an accelerator of things that were already happening, but only in on the fringes, so to speak, but they, they, they were coming in from the fringe to, to the center more and more. So for instance, in 2018, something like 10% of all post-secondary uh, courses uh, were in online enrollments. And that means growing by about 10% per annum. Uh, blended learning was starting to appear before COVID-19. You were doing it yourself, Joe, uh, with your flipped classes and so on. But it was still fairly small. It was sort of 10, 15 percent, maybe 20 percent with blended learning, 25. And what the pandemic has done is speeded that up. Now, I don't think we'll go back exactly to what we were, but we're not going to be entirely online either in the future. So there will be a shift. And that tendency, I don't think online learning will ever get to, fully online will ever get to more than 20%. There's a limited market for that. Uh, Cause you know, you're talking about adult learners. Although adult learning will become more and more important because of demographics. If we're to keep our students, we're gonna to have to increase the amount and, and there will be demand for adult learning because of the way the workforce is developing and people need reskilling, they need to change jobs, they need to get new qualifications. So that will force up the number of fully online courses, but there will also be more blended and hybrid because I think instructors have learned through the pandemic that there are some things it's best to let students do online that frees up the instructor, um, uh, but they also have to be careful of the, the workload for students as well. So that may mean reducing lectures somewhat or more likely doing more, um, but smaller ones so that students can download a 15 minute lecture, which probably covers the ground much better than they can by trying to thrash around along lot, lots of online learning resources. So I, what we're gonna see is a better mix, I think, of online and face-to-face -face teaching for most people. But certain markets like adult learning will increase the number of online learners. 
So I don't know if some, that answers the question. Yeah, well, yeah, no, it is. Uh, like some jobs, uh, like like an academic position like mine, uh, it is possible for me to actually work from home. Uh, and one of the things that I personally got out of the pandemic was that there's definitely aspects of working from home that I really like. And then this coming fall, my plan is probably to have almost a 50-50 split of when I go to campus and when I work from home. And I'm kind of looking forward to that. But here's one of the problems for me. Um, say the only thing I have left is a faculty meeting at the end of the day. And it would make sense for me to go home. I would love to do that. The only current problem is uh, just a small annoying technical problem because the we don't have our meeting room our faculty meeting room set up so that like I can't really hear that well and people can't hear me that well and so it's just a small little it's not quite as good as being there and so this kind of connects to the question uh, uh, one of our audience member asked they said that HyFlex seems to ignore the affordances and it can be very expensive to install sensitive microphones and have a camera for example following an instructor and other visual aids how do we select proper applications of HyFlex and you know like is this a burden that universities uh, need to just plan for in the future of education well, I don't like HyFlex uh, for all kinds of reasons. It's, uh, doesn't, it's a lot of work for the faculty member. Uh, it does give flexibility to students, but um, it, there's a lot, of, a lot of redundancy or duplication uh, of effort in, in HyFlex. Uh, I, I do think students should have more choice about how they study. Um, I think it's much easier to do HyFlex if you start with a fully online course and then add face-to-face -face components to it because the course, once it's designed, can run when it's only on its own, but it's there. Whereas, um, but I don't really like HyFlex. I think that students should be able to, I, I think you have to make a decision about what's best for the students. Is it going to be uh, fully face-to-face? -face? Is it going to be blended? Is it going to be fully online? And if it's going to be blended, what's the balance going to be between face-to-face -face and online? And I think most courses will end up in that middle. Um, we'll have fully online courses, as I said, for specific target groups, maybe for fourth-year students who are trying to get their um, course completed in four years, and maybe not get their classes are full and they take an online course instead. You know, there'll be specific uses of online. Um, but I, I can't see face-to-face -face on its own uh, lasting very much longer without any kind of online learning because it's more convenient for students to go home and do some work um, or, or go off into another part of the university and log in and do some work and come back to another lecture than it is. I mean, we do, we do blended learning already in most of our courses, students will be reading. I mean, reading is an, is an asynchronous activity if it just happens to be a book rather than online. So, so we do that already, just not called blended learning. I, I think what we might see is the reduction of say three lectures a week and a three credit course down to one lecture or one in-person time when people come in for a specific reason. Um, but not expecting students to do wall-to-wall -wall lectures, three, you know, 10 courses, three, three hour, one, hour, one lecture each, each hour through, or one and a half lectures each hour. You know, it's, it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. The, the, the problem is we have a 19th century structure. We got the classrooms, they have to be filled. Uh, once you go to blended learning and you stop doing three lectures a week, it's a nightmare for the administration because how do you schedule the classrooms and so on? So, you know, there's a lot of inertial, inertia in the system to moving to more flexible delivery. But I think it's inevitable in the long run. It's just a question of how fast it's going to happen. I saw this really interesting idea for uh, blended learning. So as you said, you know, we've always had blended learning where, oh, read this, do this reading assignment, and then we'll build upon that in lecture. So um, for labs, so a chemistry lab or a kinesiology lab or biology lab, one of the challenges is to, you know, you assign P uh, students, okay, make sure you read this lab before you come to the lab, because then the lab will run more smoothly, it'll be safer. 
Um, you could have a quiz to get people to make sure that they've read the lab, but many students still don't. So one instructor, uh, that I, the name is uh, escaping me right now, but uh, she created walkthrough guide, like five minute walkthrough guides on the lab on what to do and assign that. Watch this video before you come to the lab. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, she, you know, she said it, it was a huge difference. <laughs> like now, like 90% of the people actually watched the walkthrough and were able to run through the lab so much more effectively. And I thought, wow, that's a really good use of yeah. a, a blended learning that in this case, I mean, they could always read the lab, but, but they just tend to not do that. Yeah. Um, what are your comments on, on that use? Well, I, I think she's worked out the, the affordances very well. She's worked out what has to be done in the lab and what could be done outside the lab uh, and what needed to be done outside the lab to make the lab work better. So it's a really good use of both uh, online and uh, in-person teaching. It's, it's made her in-person teaching more efficient. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's a very good way of looking at online learning. How could I make my in-person teaching more efficient? How can I get a lot of the things out of the way that students can do online before they come into a class? So I can have better discussion, for instance, um, make sure they've done the work before they come in, and then make sure that in the lesson uh, that they're, they're, they're tested on what they should have done beforehand and embarrassed that they haven't done it, you know. Um, but it means redesigning that in-person time to make use of the fact that they've done work before they came in. Or again, you can organize it the other way so that they do work afterwards. But there has to be some kind of loop between the in-person and online part that enables the online work to be brought back into the face-to-face and vice versa. Um, So uh, another question that we had is, so when people are teaching online, I think uh, there are many different challenges. One of them uh, that I'd love to get your comments on is how do you increase engagement and interaction during virtual teaching? So you said that, you know, a big challenge during this pandemic was it was far too passive. Uh, and students are just tuning out. So how do instructors make engagement interaction increase during an online lecture when you might not even be able to see the audience? Well, cut down on the amount of talking and give students activities to do. Um, I I mean, before video conferencing came along, online learning was totally asynchronous. It was all about student activity. Read this, do that, uh, join this group discussion, uh, here's my feedback on your activities, etc. So um, you have to build activities into online learning. You have to give students the opportunity to move away from the screen and uh, move away from the presentation all the time so they can actually do some work and get some feedback. Yeah. So I, I, I'll, I can tell you about my own experience. So uh, when we moved to an online lecture, um, you know, one of the things that I was sort of worried about was that part of, you know, the style of how I like to lecture is even in a large lecture hall, I like to ask the students questions and I like to get reactions. Um, but then when we moved to online, that that wasn't possible because, um, uh, you know, we're using Microsoft Teams, students weren't even on camera, um, they could pose questions. So uh, my solution was I had online TAs that were helping to monitoring the chat. I use them as a proxy to stand in for the students I would ask questions in class. So I would ask them the questions and we would have this uh, dynamic interaction and conversation almost you know, as if they were this representing the students. Or if I did some sort of demonstration, uh, I would normally pick a volunteer from the physical classroom those online TAs were my volunteers for whatever demonstration that I was doing. And I found it to be very, uh, I think it was really good. Uh, The students really responded to it. They really enjoyed. And I think it helped to create a a positive environment. And so our Q&A actually really exploded. Students really uh, responded. Um, you know, I remember like in a social psychology lecture, you know, I asked them, you know, you know, when you think of a McMaster student, what are the three characteristics come to mind? 
not surprisingly, it was flooded with like very positive things. They're really studious. They're serious. They're going somewhere. Then I asked them, what are the three characteristics that come to mind from, I'm not going to name the university, but a local rival university that rhymes with Schmestern. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, su not surprisingly, th these were not favorable characteristics. And then, you know, I would ask the TAs, what are students saying? Well, you know, Connie says this, Paulina says this. And they even liked having their names, you know, recognized that way. Um, and then I said, well, that shows a demonstration of an in-group, out-group bias right there. Yeah. Um, so I think those are kind of sort of workarounds to try to make people feel like they're part of a community there's a lot of work being done on online discussion forums and how to make them work um and again you were talking the issues are what the big issue here is class size if you have a very large number of students it's impossible for one instructor to uh, respond to everything that the students come up with so various strategies have been used with large classes for fully online learning um, one is to break them up into smaller groups. And you, you can do this to some extent with synchronous learning. You use the breakout rooms, for instance, get them to do some work as a group and then post a group response. It's much easier for the instructor to respond to say 10 groups than 300 students. Um, so th there are various techniques like that that can be used. Um, uh, again, TAs are very useful uh, or even, uh, adjunct professors to one of the one of the things that happened before COVID was we fully online courses, particularly large uh, ones with large number of enrollments, is that the professor was more like a designer, would design the course, would choose the assignments, decide what topics would be taught, made sure that everything was put up on the learning management system. And then uh, adjunct professors were the tutors, if you like, for all the activities that the students did online. And the uh, senior academic would just supervise the, the adjuncts and the TAs, or, or would be a reference point. If a TA or an adjunct had a problem or thought the question was, you know, or there was a problem with the course, then they would contact the senior instructor and then it, that they would work out what the response should be. So mm -hmm. yes, there has to be a certain amount of division of labor, whether you're online, or uh, in a very large lecture class. Um, uh, so, but there are, there are a lot of well-established techniques for doing this prior to COVID-19, prior to synchronous lectures. So Tony, I really appreciate your uh, three examples that you gave at the end. Uh, and it really reminded me, uh, let me share you uh, with you an example um, um, of online teaching. Um, uh, from one of the postdocs from our McCall McBain teaching and learning program, uh, Kaylee Robertson. So I think when most people think of an online teaching scenario, they think of, well, you know, I lecture in person. So now I'm just going to give the same type of lecture online. But I think there's an opportunity for creativity in doing things that you couldn't even do in class. So this was brilliant. I thought, so Kaylee, um, um, sorry, it was Leanne. <laughs> sorry, I'm forgetting. Uh, Leanne, uh, she, uh, she's an expert on bird research. So when she was teaching her online section, she talked a bit about the theory as in a classic lecture, but then she also took her students on, uh, on site. She took us to, uh, we, we walked the trail with her as she, as she was collecting samples from the birds and then we walked into the lab and she was doing the actual uh, tests on the samples. And we were, it was like, we were right there with her. It was almost like a choose your own adventure. And I thought, wow, this is the most dynamic, interactive mm -hmm. um, teaching that I've ever seen online. It was just so creative and, and the students were so captivated by it. So um, it's only because she was online that she had this opportunity to do something so creative beyond just a standard issue lecture. Yeah. And I think that's one of the opportunities that we should, all of us should explore as instructors, things that we can do creatively and differently and not just a standard lecture. One of the things that online learning is really good for is for students to collect, do research, uh, collect their own data, 
it depends on the on the subject area but from what you're saying on with the bird research they could certainly do that um, create an e-portfolio either as individually or as a group and and then that could be the assignment uh, you don't have to give a test afterwards you can just see how well they've done that mm -hmm. uh, you might do it as a formative assignment uh, sometimes for instance in business i know that uh uh, some business courses now require students to do a two minute elevator pitch on, on their business that, and record that as a video. But instead of just assessing the, the video as the student does it, they put it in front of the other students, the other students critique it, they all critique their own videos, they go back and then they re amend the video as a result of the critique, and that's what they're assessed on. Mm. So uh, again, you know, it's just a different way of thinking about assessment because you, when you're working online, you can do assessment differently. Tony, I think uh, I, I want to end with getting your thoughts on a provocative quote from the futurist Arthur C. Clarke in 1980. He said, nothing can replace a good human teacher, but much of the drudgery of education, the routine and the road could be taken over by electronic devices. What do you think? I don't, I, I don't quite agree with that. Um, I, I, I think there's, there's two aspects here. One, teaching is a very human activity. Um, it, it, it's not a technical thing, learning. It, it's, it's, it's very much uh, a biological thing. And therefore, humans react to other humans and that really affects the way they learn and my worry is if we put everything into artificial intelligence and everything was automated there would be no relationship between the learner and the machine it would just be a machine and we've seen that already happening in some of the business areas like trying to get hold of somebody in a bank, you can't, you know, trying to talk to somebody from a telephone company, you can't. And that's very alienated, causes a lot of anger and so on. So I, I think there will, or should always be a human element in teaching and learning. I agree. <laughs> thank you so much, Tony. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, and um, Best of luck to everyone in your uh, plans for fall 2022. Uh, that's some great advice, Tony, and lots of things for us all to think about. Thank you, everyone, and good night.